Thank you so much for watching today with Marilyn and Sarah. I was praying about our time together and felt like God dropped a verse in my heart for you, for me as well. It's 1 Peter 3, verse 15. And it says, but sanctify Christ, that means set apart, Christ in your heart, always being ready to make a defense or, or explanation to everyone who asks you on account for the hope that is in you with gentleness and reverence. And I just want to encourage you that God is going to help you to share the hope, why you have this hope in your heart. Many of you are watching right now. You're strong believers in Jesus. Jesus has done amazing things for you. But God is going to help you and to empower you to share with other people how good Jesus is in your life with, and I like these words, grace, sorry, gentleness and reverence. So we're not beating people over the head, kaboom, you know, turn or burn, but rather with gentleness and with reverence that we get to share the amazing things that Jesus has done in our lives. And if you'd like to be able to share Jesus better with your family or with neighbors, coworkers, people at school, get on the phone, get on our website. We want to pray this verse for you, 1 Peter 3.15, that God helps us to know how to share Christ effectively, genuinely, and also with tremendous, I like to say it this way, mom, stickiness, you know, right. that he's just right. kind of, you know, you get around Jesus yes. and the more you're around him, the more you wanted to rub off on exactly. somebody else too, because he's really sticky. Right. <laughs> it's great. And you know, you did this teaching, mom, called kicking condemnation. Mm -hmm. Oof, it rocked. <laughs> that <laughs> well, was amazing. You, but I think everybody deals with this. There isn't anybody. And so I remember when Wally, would get real moody, real depressed, and condemn himself. And the Lord said to him, Who are you to judge another man's servant? And he said, Wait a minute. I'm not condemning other servants. I'm condemning myself. And the Lord said, You're my servant. Quit condemning yourself. Jesus took our condemnation. I, I know. I know that as you watch this, there are some things that have chained you to your past condemnations you're going to be free from today. And this message this morning is very, very key for you in transformation. Now, how can I get the most out of church? How can I get the most out of every day is by seeing Jesus. I have a friend who called me, and this was probably five years ago, and she had a terrible attack on her immune system, and she was losing her eyesight. And the doctor said, you'll never get your sight back. And so she said, she just cried out to God. And she took that scripture, you know, that as we behold him, we're changed into his image. And then the other one that, you know, uh, we know him in the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable to his death. And the Lord spoke to her and said, you just need to see me. You just need to know me. Now, she didn't go blind. She's fine. But what's the important thing for you this morning to see Jesus? Amen. So stand up. I'm going to pray for you. That's the most important thing in the whole world is to behold him. So put your hand on your heart. It's so good for you. Say, Father, Father I, believe I believe this morning that I'm going to see Jesus. As I behold him, see him, I'm transformed. I want to see Jesus. Amen. Now, does he hear our prayer? Is he pleased with that prayer? Absolutely. So you can sit down and expect him to talk to you. Expect him to encourage you. Expect him to give you a revelation. Now, I had an unusual revelation recently about something negative that I had done. I had a terrible nightmare. Now, I don't have nightmares, you know, and I pray over my sleep that I have good sleep. But I had a terrible nightmare about a situation I was going into to minister. It was just awful. I awakened and thought, oh, surely that is not true. And then I thought, why did I have that dream? And I said that to the Lord. Why did I have such a nightmare? He said, because you spoke negative things before you went to sleep about this place. And so I had said, I really don't like to go there. You know, I've been there a lot, and I just feel like they're kind of indifferent to the Word of God. And, you know, I just think, why did I say yes to this? Did you ever get negative? 
I said those things before I went to sleep, and then I caught them in my dream life. And so I would say to you this morning, it's very important what we're drawing on from Jesus, and he hears the words we speak. And we're going to look at kicking condemnation. Now, the thing about condemnation is that it has a kick back. And so when you get into condemnation, condemning yourself, condemning someone else, there's a kickback with it. And so if you're watching on television, watch very closely because God has a special message for you. Now I'm going to look at five things with you. So look at your notes and let's see where we're going. Then we'll know if we arrived at the end. First of all, we want to look at the background of condemnation. Where did it start? How did we get into it? Secondly, we want to know how to get out of condemnation into righteousness. Thirdly, we need to know how to submit to his righteousness. Fourthly, self-condemnation, where we're always beating on ourselves. And then the fifth thing is proclaiming his righteousness. Now, where did all of this self-condemnation start? It's so serious. It started in the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve ate of the tree, they felt condemned. They knew they had disobeyed God. So what did they do? They hid themselves. They covered themselves with leaves. And then when God showed up, they didn't want to see him. Why? They felt how? Tell me how they felt. Condemned, to judge down, to put under. And they felt very condemned. Now, remember, God then, you know, clothed them with skin, which would have to do with the shedding of the blood. But watch what they said. When they felt condemned, they hid themselves. They were in fear. They were in anxiety. They were in distress. And it all started out of condemnation. I believe the root of all fear, all anxiety, even depression, is condemnation. So when he spoke to them, remember Adam, and this is what condemnation does. When we feel condemned, then we condemn somebody else. Well, I'm not the only one who's done that. Go talk to them. They're ugly too. And so if you remember, Eve said, well, the devil made me do it. Adam said, Eve made me do it. And so from that condemnation, they begin to condemn one another, put the blame on somebody else, and that's very sad. Condemnation is an ugly, ugly thing. And when we get born again, we are all so aware of this that our sins are all forgiven. Is that all? Everybody say all. Does that have to do with past, present, future? Our sins are all forgiven, but... Most Christians never say, I have the righteousness of Jesus. So what happened? Jesus took your sins and gave you his righteousness. And righteousness is a big, big deal. Because people who know that they have the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, they live better, they think better, they act better. Because condemnation, out of that root comes fear and anxiety and depression. So I believe condemnation is the root of all of the ugly things that come into our lives. I really do. And I think so many times Christians have heard so much about, I'm forgiven of my sins, which you should. That's the cross. But they don't hear, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Because we think that's too arrogant. But that's God's gift. There's been a divine switch. He took your sins, gave you his righteousness. Put out your left hand. Say, he took my sins, gave me his righteousness. And that's key for us. So I've asked Jordan if she would come and kind of show us something here because I'm going to give a demonstration with this scripture. So Old Testament deals with condemnation and righteousness. Hi, Jordan. How are you? Now, Jordan looks very casual. Is that right? So it looks like he could take a bath and clean up a little. And so I'm going to read this scripture, and then we're going to demonstrate. But it says in Zechariah 3, 2 through 4, And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem 
rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel. Then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, See, I have removed your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with rich robes. So would you put this on? I can't put it on you. It's kind of whatever. That's backwards. You want to turn it around? Okay. Now, what is this? This is the devil accusing. Who accuses you? Who condemns you? Who does it? Satan condemns you. And he is condemning Joshua. Now, who is Joshua? He is the priest after they come back from the 70 years of captivity. Now, what is he? If he's representing the people and the high priest represented the people, he was dirty because Israel was dirty. They had been in idolatry, all kinds of junk and trash, and God had warned them, and finally they went into captivity. Now they're coming back, and the devil says, well, what's your high priest? He's filthy. Israel is filthy. He accuses. Everybody say, Satan accuses me. Put your hand here. Say, Satan accuses me. But the angel said, clothe him in white. And so when we are born again, wow, all the filthiness of our sin is covered with his righteousness. Amen? Does that make you slap happy? Well, you're going to get happier. Thank you, Jordan, very much. Sarah and I are so excited about going to Brazil in 2013, late October and early November at Iguazu. We will have evangelism and healing meetings. Experience one of the new natural wonders of the world, the famous Iguazu waterfalls. That's really true, Mom, and it's exciting because we get to go in a boat on the bottom of it and then walk on the top, you know, and the tops of it to see such beautiful things. And we get to see the place where three countries meet, Argentina, Paraguay, and Brazil at the top of the falls. Plus, we get to go to Rio de Janeiro, Mom, with historic city tours and four days of healing and evangelism meetings. The best oh we've my had, goodness. the most we've had. So you just have to be a part of this. If you don't go, I almost feel sorry for you. <laughs> so get on the phone, get on our website, and start praying for Brazil. Late October, early November, the trip for you and your family. Feeling stressed? Insecure? Upset? When you let these feelings control your life, you're in for a wild ride. In 30 Days to Taming Your Emotions by best-selling author Deborah P. Gay, you will discover the secrets to taming tension, bending without breaking, pursuing peace, maintaining a victorious mindset, and much more. In this book, you will find sound Bible-based teaching, personal stories, heart-searching challenges, and the path to personal authenticity, tranquility, and quality relationships. For your gift of $25, along with Taming Your Emotions, we would also like to send you our Joy and Peace Scripture Card and Maryland's Prescription for a Hurting Heart Book. God has an anointed prescription for hurting hearts, and it's guaranteed to work. Don't let out-of-control emotions rob you of God's best. These two powerful resources will help you along with your 30-day path to taming your emotions and changing your life. Call or click to receive this very special offer. Okay, so now let's go on and, and let's just look some more at the background. Old Testament tells you that we're all unclean, that our righteousness is like filthy rags. But Old Testament also gives some little hints and keys along the way about righteousness. For example, Jeremiah. Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. Well, he was a prophet in a dark time. I wouldn't have wanted to be in Jeremiah's time. I wouldn't have at all. And the people are going to be taken into captivity because they are in terrible idolatry. And so Jeremiah begins to prophesy to them. He cries all the time because the people are not repenting or surrendering. And then God gives him a revelation. And he gives him one of the redemptive names of God, and it is Jehovah to Sidkenu. Jehovah means the revealing one, and to Sidkenu is righteousness. What does God want to reveal to you today? That Jesus gave you his righteousness, 
And so there is a revelation of righteousness, and that is very important to us. So that kind of gives you some Old Testament background, but you say, okay, Jesus took my sins. How many of you are born again? Wave at me. Say, Jesus took my sins. But Jesus gave me his righteousness. You say, well, I just can't believe that, you know, because I think wrong things. I say wrong things. I do wrong things. But let's just look at it. It says in number two, just as Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. How did Abraham, how is he called the righteousness of God? By faith. How do you know your sins are forgiven? By faith. How do you know you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus? By faith. Scripture says it. Jesus has made unto me wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. And so we take the forgiveness of sins by faith. We take the righteousness of Jesus by faith. Everybody say faith. faith. Stand up. You say, Meryl, it's hot in here. No, it isn't. It's wonderful in here. Now turn around, look at me, turn all the way around, don't play <laughs> that game with me, turn all the way around, say I know that the righteousness of God is by faith and it brings a turnaround in my life, amen, you can be seated. So faith brings you into his righteousness. Now, when Jesus walked on the earth, and then afterwards even, the Jews did not really accept Jesus well. Why? Because they thought righteousness was by performance. And frankly, folks, most Christians think that. Well, if I perform good enough, God will like me. If I'm this, 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 then he will think I'm righteous. If I read my Bible, I read 55 chapters every day, pray in tongues 10 hours, then I'm righteous. That's performance. But God gives you the gift. Performance is something you have to do, but gift is something you receive. And you receive his righteousness by what? Faith. And the Gentiles, they received by faith. The Jews said, oh no, it isn't according to the law. No performance. And so it's very key to us that we see the performance was done by Jesus. He never sinned, but he took all of our sin and then gave us his righteousness. Look at Philippians 3, 9. I love this. It says, and be found in him. Everybody say, in him. Now, if you are a Christian, are you in him? Say, I'm in him. Not having my own righteousness, it's obvious we don't have it, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. So it's key for us to understand what we have by faith, very key. And if we don't believe for it, then we don't act in it. Now I know what you're gonna say. Well, if I think I'm the righteousness of God, then I'll go out and do anything and say I'm the righteousness of God. I'm going to address that question and we're gonna step over the line from that. That is a sick excuse. Say yuck three times. Yuck, yuck, yuck. Righteousness is so important. And I looked at that paralyzed man that was dropped through the roof, and I noticed that Jesus dealt with sin in his life before he healed him. Then I got all involved with 1 Peter, uh, 2.24, and you've used it a lot, I'm sure. I have for healing. For years, I've stood on this scripture for healing. Who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sin, might live for righteousness. Now listen, by whose stripes you are healed. You know, we say, oh yeah, Jesus took my sickness, my diseases, he took my sin. But wait a minute. When you see your righteousness first, then you have greater faith for your healing. Okay, now listen to me. A lot of people, when you pray for them for healing, they say, well, I've been such a bad person. You know, I just don't deserve it. No, I don't think you do either. It's a gift. Everybody say, it's a gift. But how did healing come? 
It came out of Jesus dying for your sin. How did righteousness come? It came when Jesus took your sins and gave you his, what? Righteousness. Can you receive that? That is such a powerful truth. I heard a testimony this week that was so outstanding about an Ethiopian man, born again, spirit-filled, really turned on to God. He lives in the city, actually, and has kind of a high position. But he was a communist, and I don't know how many people he killed or all the things he did, but he lived a pretty bad life in Ethiopia. They put him in prison for 10 years. Now, when you think communists, think atheists, because they worship communism as their God, and they say openly, you know, I'm an atheist. So he's put in prison for 10 years, and maybe longer, because they're saying he, he did such terrible things, but somebody smuggled a Bible into him. And so what did he have to do every day? Read the Bible. He read the Bible. He read the Bible. He read the Bible. He received Jesus and really began to see that he was righteous. He had the gift of righteousness. So he began to pray that he would have favor and would get out of prison. And within a year, he was out. He's born again. And he says very openly, and I pray in tongues. And he has a high position in our nation, actually in our city. But how did it start when he received who? Jesus. When you received Jesus, did he forgive all your sins? Did he give you the gift of righteousness? Now, see, that's where I don't think we come into it because we say, I don't deserve it. I've done too many wrong things, stupid things. So the third point is submitting to the righteousness of Jesus. It says, for they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, performance, 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 have not submitted to the righteousness of God. I have to submit to his righteousness. Now listen to me closely. We're about to cross over the line here. The Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Is that true? As you think is the way you're going to behave. So people will say to me, well, if you run around saying you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, it just gives you a license to sin, just the opposite. If I think I have the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, how many of you think it could keep me out of sin? Absolutely. And I think this is a lie of the enemy to keep us from living victorious lives. Now, I'll tell you something I did that was really stupid, really bad. I was in the airport at Frankfurt. I was very upset because I walked and walked and walked, and they had wrong directions. And I mean, you can walk for miles. It took me an hour and a half to get to the gate where I was supposed to be. It's early morning. I'm tired. I've traveled all night, probably been awake. So I went up to the woman at the desk, and I said, I hate this airport. Uh, you don't have directions. I've walked for an hour and a half finally to get here. And, you know, she was very nice and you know, did all the things. And then I sat down, and the Lord said to me, you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Didn't sound like it. <laughs> Didn't look like it. And I'm sitting there thinking, man, what a great expression of Jesus you are today. So I just went up to her and told her. I said, I'm so sorry. I was so short with you. I was so ugly with you. I said... You know, I'm a Christian, and I know better. I, my sins have been forgiven, but I have the righteousness of God. Please forgive me. That was not right behavior. When you get right believing, right thinking, you get right acting. Feeling stressed? Insecure? Upset? When you let these feelings control your life, you're in for a wild ride. In 30 Days to Taming Your Emotions by best-selling author Deborah Pigay, you will discover the secrets to taming tension, bending without breaking, pursuing peace, maintaining a victorious mindset, and much more. In this book, you will find sound Bible-based teaching, personal stories, heart-searching challenges, and the path to personal authenticity, tranquility, and quality relationships. For your gift of $25, along with Taming Your Emotions, we would also like to send you our Joy and Peace Scripture Card and Maryland's Prescription for a Hurting Heart Book. God has an anointed prescription for hurting hearts, and it's guaranteed to work. 
Don't let out-of-control emotions rob you of God's best. These two powerful resources will help you along with your 30-day path to taming your emotions and changing your life. Call or click to receive this very special offer. Did you know that one prayer can change your life forever? You say, one prayer. Yes, one prayer. When I was 16 years old, I prayed one prayer that is still changing my life. I'm in my 70s, and not only is it changing my life daily and has for all these years, but I have eternal life because of that one prayer. Oh, that prayer transforms everything. You say, well, what is the prayer? And I'll tell you what it is. I invited Jesus to come into my heart and be Lord of my life. I repented of my sins and he came into my heart and he's never left me. And he will never leave you either because the Bible says, Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will give you eternal life. Are you ready to pray that prayer? Maybe you've never prayed it. Maybe you've prayed it, but your life is out of sync. Hey, you can pray and recommit your life to him. Pray with me right now. Mean this with your heart. Say, Father, I believe you love me. You have a wonderful plan for my life. I am sorry for my sins and the wrong things I have done. Please forgive me. Cleanse me with the blood of Jesus Christ. I have faith in his blood. Jesus, come into my heart. Be Lord of my life. Thank you for saving me. Amen. Did you pray that prayer? Your life is changed and transformed. You will never be the same. Did you recommit your life? Expect transformation. And above all, know that your name is written in heaven and not in hell.